Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good? I hope so. So do we know what week we are today? This is 7 20, 20. That's the class for today, July the 20th, 2020. Okay. So you need to know it's the third week, right? And today's topic is going to be westernization of Asia. Okay. Do you remember last week's topic? That was early modern Asia, 16th to 18th century. You remember our first week? That was the Mongol Empire. Okay. So today, again, repeating July 20th, 2020, this is westernization of Asia. So other than that, I hope everybody's doing well and trying to stay cool. It's very hot uh, this last week. So I know I'm hot. I'm not sure where everybody lives, but I live close to Hollywood and it's pretty hot. So yeah. So without further ado, as I usually say, let's get to the uh, reading material. So again, we're HIS 103, Asian History, week three, 720, 2020. Okay, so I'm gonna minimize my face up in the corner to get it out of the way. And it looks like I won't be covering anything where you can't read or can't hear me pronounce it, but that's good. So as we start the age of westernization, 1900 to 1929. Empires end, Republican Revolution in China. Defeat at the hands of Japan in the, some people pronounce it Sino-Japanese, some people pronounce it Sino. So I hear more often Sino, so Sino-Japanese War of 1895 irrevocably shattered China's traditional sense of self-assurance and what remained of the pre-modern Chinese world order was rapidly undermined thereafter. Okay, so there's some high level words in there that I have to go over. Okay, so when they say defeats of the hand, so we know that they lost the war in 1895. Irrevocably means you cannot fix it. In this situation, you cannot fix or change what happened in the war. They lost. And then shattered China's traditional self-assurance. So the before they tried to become modern, the traditional Chinese way of life and thinking and culture was destroyed or shattered. And the self-insurance is their confidence. That's what that means. So all this was destroyed. Um, I can try to put it in a more modern sense. I don't know how many of the uh, guys in here follow boxing. So, a little bit older than most people in here by a couple of days. And uh, as you grow up and you see some new young champion, he's never lost a fight and he's just destroyed everybody, he doesn't think he can lose. So the first time this fighter loses, their feeling of invincibility that they can never lose is shattered and gone forever because they realize they can be. And this is what happened to China. They felt, you know, China's had a long feeling of their being, feeling that they're the center of the earth. So to lose this war to such a small island state as Japan really shattered their confidence. 
And as we continue, it says what remained of the pre-modern, so before China made an attempt to go modern, was rapidly undermined thereafter. Okay, undermine is another tricky word. Uh, undermine is usually used for something that uh, is planned against you. You might not even realize it that, uh, you know, bad things are happening behind your back, right? Uh, we always, we use this term in like, let's say I share a business with uh, Mr. Hong, right? And we're all confident with each other and we're 50-50. But he doesn't know I'm stealing behind his back and I'm gonna try to take the money and open my own restaurant. So what I'm doing to him is I'm undermining him. So until he finds out, he does not realize that I'm undermining him. And it's, they're trying to put this, that China was so confident. They were just gonna stay with Taoist classics and the traditional rule that to have their world destroyed losing this war, they realized, uh uh-oh, Japan was able to do that because they had modern things and we too need to be modern. So they, they, they woke up. In 1891 and 1897, the reformer Kang Yu Wei, 1858 to 1927, that's his lifespan, published two controversial and repeatedly banned books that argued that the existing texts of the Confucian, so here we go, Confucian classics had been distorted by forgeries dating from the first century and that Confucius, far from being a conservative transmitter of ancient tradition, had actually been a reformer in his own day. So controversial means uh, people are not sure about the truth here. And a lot of times people are getting angry. And then the books were banned, so nobody could read them. So usually in history, in any country, when you get controversial books, a lot of times they're banned at the beginning. Okay, and that they possibly had been distorted or changed by forgeries. That's when someone else, like if I'm Confucius and my books were forged, it means I didn't sign them. Someone else did. Maybe my enemy, my best friend, who knows? Okay, and since Confucius has always been uh, put in the, the uh, area of a conservative Chinese person and uh, respecting conservative Chinese values, someone said, hey, he might have been a reformer in his own day. Okay, despite this attempt to rejuvenate, rejuvenate means to give you energy, almost to make you feel young again. So. Despite this attempt to rejuvenate the sage Confucius in the modernizing guise of a reformer, so role is guise, such scholarship already betrayed a profound loss in tradition. So already, if you even think this as a Chinese person at the time, then you have lost a big amount of your faith in the traditional Chinese way of thinking. At the bottom, in 1898, one important official, while apparently arguing conservatively for maintaining Chinese learning for the fundamental principles, simultaneously also acknowledged I guess I don't like myself on the top, so I'm so nervous I have to move myself on the bottom. Acknowledge that in a time of drastic formation or transformation, substantial modernizing reforms were appropriate. So transformation is when you go, and drastic means severe. So you go from one way to another, right? Some people can have a drastic transformational weight loss, right? That's one way to look at it. So after 1898, even this relatively modern approach tended to be abandoned in favor of more radical modernization. So that's why we're talking about radical.
contrasting. Just a little is not enough. They want the people at the time wanted more, at least the people in power. The Japanese victory in 1895 had sounded an alarm. And following the Boxer disaster in 1900, they're talking about the Boxer Rebellion where China fought against foreign powers that were slicing up China. And they call it Boxer because they lost a lot of Kung Fu men who mysteriously thought that their Kung Fu would protect them against bullets. And fortunately, they lost. Even in the Qing government recognized the need for rapid or quick reform. China had been exposed as vulnerable. Again, see, they didn't realize they were vulnerable until they were exposed. A once mighty empire, apparently reduced to being the sick man of Asia, and in need of some fairly dramatic measures to pull itself out of the past and adjust to modern world realities. Uh, says C. Figure 8, don't worry about that. New XIN suddenly became a fashionable buzzword in 20th century China. So fashionable buzzword means a very, very popular word. Beginning with the Qing dynasty's new policies and new schools in the first decade and reaching its climax with the new culture of the May 4th movement in the second decade of the century, but that's in the second decade, so we won't really discuss that at this time. Uh, epitomized by the title of its most famous journal, New Views, again, but that's deeply in the time of Mao, not at this time, okay? Okay, uh, now we're at the bottom. So here's the eight one if you wanna see it. The Last Days of the Chinese Empire, a lone writer at the Ming Tombs, which I think Gao says she's gonna have me buried at the Ming Tombs when I die, in North China, 1907. So uh, what this picture is trying to tell you is the beauty and the elegance of the past shown at the present time of China in 1907, where obviously a poor, poor man riding on top of a, looks like a donkey, right? So we're trying to show you the dichotomy of the two. So finishing up at the bottom of the page, it says, uh, in 1902, the Empress Dowager Sixi authorized an edict ordering the abolition of foot binding, a painful and disabling custom that had been widespread amongst China or Chinese women since the Song Dynasty. And although foot binding, that's where I have to stop because I got my book here and that's where the questions are. But if you're not familiar with uh, foot binding from China at the time, uh, traditional Chinese thought that women had to have tiny, tiny feet. So they bound their feet at youth with these ropes and put on very tiny shoes because they didn't want the feet to grow. And unfortunately, if you see the women's feet, which were very painful and disfigured, without the shoes and the socks and the binding, um, I would say they look like pig's feet. They were that deformed and painful, just kind of like in a claw-like position. So, so she ordered the abolition or the ending of foot binding, okay? So, like I said, we're at the bottom of the page since I have my book here as a backup system. So I have to go to the whiteboard. Get the pencil for our first question. Okay.
So simple, straightforward questions. One, what shattered China's confidence in 1895? Was it that they lost the soccer game with the United States? Would that be it? Uh, was it that they stopped soy sauce production? What shattered China's confidence in 1895? Okay. So my next question for our first pick. I'm getting another long question and you're gonna luckily have a short answer. So two, which incident also pushed China's Qing government to become modern? So this is connected to one. So something happened in one that made China lose its confidence. And two, once you find out what one is, what else pushed China's Qing government to become modern? Three, this will be the last one for the first page. Number three, China's Qing dynasty implemented what for change? So they implemented something for changing from the pre-modern to the modern. Uh, my hint to you is there might be more than one, okay? So I'll give you a minute or two to write those down. Mark off that we did this page and that I've asked you these questions. Get that out of the way. Okay, hopefully you're doing good today, Titan. And you, Tamujin. Okay. okay, we're ready for this. I'll repeat as I go get the eraser. Okay, one, what shattered China's confidence? Again, I think it's because they lost a soccer game to the United States. We're usually the worst in the world, so it's tough to, to lose to the US. Two, which incident also pushed China's Qing government to become modern? Uh, again, I think it was loss of soy sauce production. Two's gone. Three, China's Qing dynasty implemented what for change? Uh, I would guess they started uh, importing Panda Expresses around the world. That's how they did that, okay? So that's done, okay? Now, I'm gonna go back to the screen, or me to the lecture. So this was our last page here with the imposing looking fellow right here. Okay, so we proceed. No, I think my, what do you guys think? My photo's okay or? Okay, I guess not. I guess I shouldn't show myself. 
wait a minute, I, did I press this thing too hard? Let me see. Okay, here's this. Okay, oh, okay, so I stop where I see this. Okay, so uh, the abolition or the forbidding of the traditional examination system in 1905 was immediately effective and dealt a fatal or death blow to the old examination selected Mandarin site. Also in 1905, a group of imperial commissioners traveled for eight months in Japan, United States, and uh, Europe, yes. Why would they do that? Okay. To study the models of constitutional government. They were interested in other Western style forms of government. Remember, they wanted to become modern. And Japan had become modern also. After their return, a nine year program of constitutional reform was announced in 1908 that included the installation of elected provincial representative assemblies by 1909 and a promise of gradual transition to self-government. Okay. Yet, even these dramatic reforms were no longer enough. Remember we had discovered earlier they wanted rapid transformation. The new schools were often simply converted temples or former Confucian academies that remained far from universally accessible and that were not necessarily really very different from their pre-modern predecessors, the predecessors of whom came before. The electorate uh, for the 1909 provincial elections was no more than half of 1% of the population. So that means it was all done for the high level people in government, not the true population. The Meiji Japanese and Imperial German model that was favored for the Qing dynasty reforms with its assertive role for centralized authoritarian imperial government also disappointed would be local leaders as well as reformers who held more liberal Anglo-American style aspirations. In addition, breaking with long-standing Qing dynasty precedents, or what came before, princes from the imperial family began to play a more active role in government. And that brings me at the bottom of this page. Actually, the picture goes on this page. So that's why it's only half. So we'll go back to the whiteboard. Let me ask these questions. This will be question four. Again, long question for me, short answer for you.
1904. In 1905, why did a group of China's imperial commissioners travel to Japan, the US and Europe? Did they travel there to go to all the Disneylands, right? Go to Tokyo Disney and Disneyland, the original in Los Angeles, and then uh, Francis Disneyland. Is that why they traveled? The Chinese Imperial Commissioners in 1905? That's what I think. They wanted to experience Disneyland in all its forms. Next question. Since it is a half a page, you only get two questions. Are you happy? Taking it easy on you. Only two questions here. China was aiming toward what? So I might have someone like Tim who just said, aiming? Are they doing archery? It just means moving toward, going toward, right? That's what it means. So I'll give you a few to answer those. And let me do my markings here. Okay, you guys got that? You know, let me go for the uh, eraser or not or did Puravi steal it again or he's hiding it in his uh, bag of tricks Let's see if I can get Inky to steal it back for me okay repeating for 1905 why did a group of China's imperial commissioners travel to Japan the US and Europe and my answer would be to go to the different Disneyland five China was aiming towards what, or moving towards what, meaning politically, governmentally, things like that, okay? Okay, so I've marked the pages. I've got to turn my page. see here. Did I already jump? Did this push me to the next one? I'll have to look. Okay, no. Okay. All right. So I read on down to more active or Meiji, long-standing Qing president. Yes. Okay, only 1% of China's population. They held eight of 13 heads of ministry in 1906 and nine or five of nine governmental general positions in 1907. This was particularly unfortunate because it coincided, meaning it happened at the same time with the introduction of modern Western ideas of national self-determination. After some two centuries of widespread acceptance of Manchu rule under the Qing dynasty, at the turn of the 20th century, Many Chinese people suddenly awoke to the idea that they were the conquered subjects of foreign Manchus. Remember, Manchus are not part of the predominantly Han ethnic majority. Uh, ending Manchu rule became the first priority of the new Chinese nationalism. Continuing. 
something like venation, of course, is an ancient phenomenon or occurrence thing. But pre-modern states in China and elsewhere were often defined more by their ruling elites than by their people. So again, that's why we had that 1% prior. The king and the royal family ruled over the population of people. Most of the people did not have any power politically whatsoever. It has been argued that the true modern nationalism had its origins in 16th century England, when the first people began to be conceived as the ultimate source of legitimate sovereignty. Sovereignty is, um, every country has a sovereignty, which means you cannot come in illegally, you cannot evade it, you cannot make that country's money, all these things belong to the country of origin. So that's what sovereignty is. So as the spread of print technology, see printing, promoted increasingly standardized national languages, High German, Parisian French, for example, gaining prestige or fame over local dialects as national standards. A new sense of participation in a shared national community began to take shape. Okay, among the, now I'll stop there. I'll try to give you a similar example. Uh, if you watch, uh, hopefully you do. I know a lot of my students, like a lot of my Korean students come and they watch Korean television shows. And uh, Mexicans do the same thing, right? Not sure about my Mongolians because I have not seen a Mongolian channel, but uh, Channel 18 does broadcast for Filipinos. And uh, I think a Japanese too at a certain time. I've seen some Japanese shows on the weekend. Uh, anyway, what I'm trying to say is here, for example, here, if you watch the American news here, nine times out of 10, whatever it is, uh, two, four, five, seven, nine, or 11, uh, people sound like Californians, right? People sound like Californians. And that's what they're talking about here with the standardized national languages, right? So I'm guessing that if you watch news in China, let's say, uh, probably your major news affiliation people, stations, they want people that sound like they're from Beijing. They don't want people that sound like they're from some country village, right? And the same here. We don't, you're not going to see probably some guy, well, I'm from a small town of Kentucky and I came from the mouths of Appalachia. You're not going to hear that, right? You're going to hear people that sound like big city people, right? Intelligent. That's what they're trying to say or foster even though that might not be the case okay so that's the modern example okay so reading public okay. so uh, continuing the first east asian invocation of this originally european concept invocation meaning the actual implementation or use of it in some way of the concept of nation. Apparently it came during the Meiji area, Japanese popular rights movement. So this started in Japan first, when a new two character Japanese expression, Minzoku, sounds pretty good. Like I'll have some mochi and Minzoku please. Uh, meaning roughly the people clan, clan meaning a term for central group of people. Uh, Chinese English seems to use clan a lot. English, not so much. And was coined to translate the national in French expressions such as Assemblée Nationale. In this case, obviously still referring to the popular sovereignty, their sovereignty again. By the end of the 19th century, however, this Japanese word was coming to be used more commonly in approximation, which means closeness, of the German word Volk. Okay. I think you've heard that word before. 
indicating a community which supposedly shared linguistic, cultural, historical, and other ties. So uh, back to Volk. I'm sure you've heard of the Volkswagen, right? Volkswagen. You know who was behind the concept of the Volkswagen? Uh, by the way, Volk means people. So Volkswagen means people's car. Uh, Adolf Hitler was behind the concept of trying to get every German car. Believe it or not. Okay. So going after the seven number there, nations in that sense are peoples possessing or having allegedly distinctive characteristics and ideally independently self-governing, so they govern themselves, came to be widely viewed as the natural divisions of humanity in the 19th century Europe. Germany itself became a classic example of modern nation state building as the Prussian kingdom expanded from 1866 1871 to forge the first ever unified German name. A lot of places like Italy and what have you, they were a collection of different states and were not all together and claimed as a country. But in modernization, these things happened and took care of that situation. So heading towards the bottom of the page, like many other modern Japanese translations of European terms, this new word for nation soon made its way to China where the same two character combination pronounced Minzu. If I had my Chinese students here, I'd ask them if that's correct. Right. So hopefully, Gao wouldn't be here telling me, oh no, teacher, Minzu means flat tire in Chinese. Uh, could be imported and easily understood directly in written form. Both in the political sense of popular sovereignty, everybody agrees on the sovereignty, and the communal sense of Volk, the people. This new idea of nationalism demanded an end in China to hereditary rule by non-Chinese Manchu emperors. So this was a slick technique to say, as this progressed, eventually the Chinese Manchu, who were not Han, would be out. And they had based their kingdom on hereditary rule, which means my father dies, I become the ruler. I die, my son becomes the ruler. Okay? So they want to get rid of that in the new style of government. Because such nationalism was originally a Western idea in China as elsewhere, the earliest nationalists tended to emerge or come out from the ranks of persons who were deeply exposed to modern Western thought. So again, if you have a very traditional way of thinking or country style, like my Korean say shigol, you're not gonna have these modern kinds of ideas floating around in your head. But if you had traveled some to the West and seen other governments, then these things can make an impression on you. Again, with a Modern example, I've had many Korean men through the years say, oh, I married my lovely wife in Korea and she was a great traditional Korean wife. And then we moved to LA and after living here so many years, she changed so much and became a Western style woman who wanted Prada, Gucci, and who knows what else. So unless you're influenced and have been in these areas, it's hard to think other than the traditional. In China's case, appropriately, the first great nation, nationalist revolutionary was, 
who was it? I think it's the guy in the picture to the right. Was also one of the most thoroughly westernized major figures. So pay attention to that westernized. We will find out why, what his background is shortly. In all of Chinese history, Dr. Sun Yat-sen. And uh, if you go to the traditional Chinatown in Los Angeles, not what my new young uh, mainland Chinese people call Chinatown, which they call Alhambra, Monterey Park, El Monte. That's not what I'm talking about. The original Chinatown that was built by Cantonese people, the original wave of Chinese that came here. There is a statue of Sun Yat-sen there at the, at the beginning or the entrance of Chinatown. So you should go see that. And he lived from 1866 to 1925. So, uh, so this is Dr. and his wife dressed. Well, she's completely in uh, Western furs and he's dressed more Chinese style, but he's allowing his wife to dress like that. So that brings us to the bottom of the page. Means it's time for questions again. Get that pencil. Okay. Did I get that pencil? Come here, pencil. Okay, so this means my first question will be six. This will be a little shorter question. Good for me. My fingers are getting tired. Let me make sure I get my spelling all okay. correct. Question six, what became the first priority of Chinese nationalism? What's the very first thing they wanted to do? Was it that they wanted to kick out foreigners? Was that the first thing they wanted to do? Who knows? Only Gao knows. Seven. Seven. What did the Chinese word Minzu mean? What did it mean? Did it mean the Chinese equivalent of the Japanese mochi? Can I have two chocolate Minzu, please? Is that what Minzu meant? Am I lying again? I know my students always accuse me of lying, but I can't, I can't do that. I'm a, I'm a religious man. I can't uh, lie. I'm a monk. Yes, Shaolin monk. I must go back to Hunan temple. Okay. Eight. Okay, I think I gave this away earlier, but who was China's first great nationalist revolutionary? Was it Mao Zedong, Gao Xinping, 
or maybe Puyi, who was China's first great nationalist. Um, revolutionary. And I think that's my last question for this page. So I'll give you a minute to do that. Let me do my markings. Our next page coming up is only gonna be a quarter page. But even though it's gonna be very small, I'm still gonna ask you at least one question. <laughs> Don't get angry. All right, so um, write those down as quick as you can, Caroline. And Ken, make, make, Caroline, make sure you wake up Ken. I know he's been sleeping for the first hour of class. Wake him up. Probably misses Seattle chop, that's why. Okay, Let's see here. Let me get the eraser. So six, repeating what became the first priority of Chinese nationalism. It was to kick me out of China, that's what it was. Seven, what did the Chinese word Minzu mean? Again, if I was gambling, I would say Minzu means mochi, like in Japanese. So let me have two chocolate minzu. That's gone. Eight, who was China's first nationalist revolutionary? I would say it's between Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, and my buddy Pu Yi. That's the three, I think, right? But I lie sometimes. Okay. All right, so those are done. So I have to head back to the So again, here's that beautiful picture of Dr. Sun Yat-sen with his beautiful wife. Uh, I'm old enough, I think I dated her a couple of times, okay. So we have them at the bottom, let me proceed. And uh, let me make sure I go to this. Yeah, this will, this is short, but I do have a question from it, so let me read. Uh, so this picture is dated uh, by Mrs. Sun Yat-sen, Canton, which is now called Guangzhou, January 14th, 1926. Hoover Institution Archives, Paul Myron Wentworth, Line Barter Papers. Well, that's a long name. Paul Myron Wentworth, Line Barter Papers. Yes. Too long for me. Uh, Sun Yat sen uh, was a Cantonese peasant. Peasant means somebody very, very poor no money, no property. By birth, born that is, far from the traditional centers of Chinese culture and power. So Canton is very far from Beijing or Shanghai. And speaking an unintelligible local Southern dialect. So this gets back to the language I talked about earlier. Remember in uh, LA and New York, you want people that sound intelligent and from the city. We don't want any country to our people from the mountain. You're not going to hear that on the news. So he was not thought of as too cool here because he spoke a strange local southern dialect, not Mandarin. But in 1879, he was sent to join an older brother in Hawaii. Oh, nice. In Hawaii, Sun was placed in a boarding school where the language of instruction was English. Sun became fluent in English, and he also became a Christian, so he was no longer a Confucianist or a Buddhist like most Chinese at the time. He completed his formal education in Hong Kong with training uh, in Western style medicine. This is an intelligent fellow here. Uh, altogether, Sun spent some third years as a student or protege, which means the one most important student, of Western Protestant missionaries. And until the age 46, he lived most of his life outside of China. 
even though that's where he was born and sent away at a young age. Inspired by his intimate knowledge of the modern West, see again, exposing to the West, had he stayed in Guangzhou, none of these things would have happened. Sun hoped to create a Western style nation state and republic in China, sometimes specifically taking the United States as his model. Okay. So like I said, even though this is short, I got a question for you. Back for that pencil. One question. Hopefully it's not, you want a hard question or an easy question? I think Temujin said very hard, something like physics combined with astronomy. And I'm teaching an Asian history class, sorry. Sun Yat-sen wanted to create what in China, okay? What did he want to create? Did he want to create a large building, a shopping mall, a Chinese car dealership? What did he want to create in China? Okay. So go ahead and do that, Titan. Let me mark this question as being asked. Mark that I've gone over this quarter page. Right. All right. So again, Sun Yat sen wanted to create what in China? A Chinese Disneyland? Shanghai has a Chinese Disneyland. And Shanghai has the now the largest Starbucks in the world. So maybe that's what he wanted to do. We shall see. Oh, where's that eraser? That is gone. And, uh, okay. So let me make sure Rex, we have to jump for Li Xuan. She probably has the book. She always buys the book. She gets has sleepless nights if she doesn't have the book. So each one, we're jumping from 233, just to let you know, to 244. Okay. And we're at the part where it says Korea under Japanese rule, 1905 to 1945. Okay. So that's only for Li Xuan, because she's usually the only student that demands the book. So. This is where we stop. I have to proceed. Okay, so like I said, here it is, but you don't see the page number. I just supplied it to her. We ready? We ready, Freddie? Here. Uh, Korea under Japanese rule, 1905 to 1945. The emperor and former king of Korea, I think his name was King Saba Saba, was able to temporarily maintain. Korean independence by playing Russian interests off against Japan. So what that means there is Japan, he knew Japan, the emperor at the time wanted to invade and take over Korea, but uh, he used the help of Russia's interests since Russia was quite large and Japan did not really want to fight Russia against them. But room for any further maneuver evaporated. So evaporate is like saying disappear. If you put water on a hot sidewalk, it will disappear, it will evaporate. Suddenly after Japan defeated Russia in war in 1905, ooh, but Japan had confidence, look at that. From the Japanese perspective or point of view, the Korean peninsula 
which reach to just 50 miles from Japan's shores. Their perspective was like a dagger, which is a knife, pointed at the heart of Japan. Wow, pretty tough stuff. In one per persuasively threatening image, and persuasive means to change your thinking and make you agree with what the person is talking about. So Japan wanted to make people agree with them was understandably perceived as strategically vital. So this is the truth here. Uh, Korea was just vital for them in their thinking that if they had uh, Korea, then they could protect themselves from China or maybe even use Korea as a jump off point to attack China, so they needed it. Uh, the Chinese had been expelled or kicked out from Korea after the Sino-Japanese War in 1895. But in the meantime, the Russians had begun building their Trans-Siberian Railway in 1891 and acquired a naval base at Port Arthur on the tip of Liaodong Peninsula in southern Manchuria in 1898. So those of you who don't know, that's in China. To oppose this approaching Russian power, instead of demobilizing after the Sino-Japanese War, the Japanese budget of 1896 actually called for doubling the size of the military. So how they were feeling confident doubling the military size. Russia's primary interest lay in Manchuria, while Japan's interest lay in Korea. But neither power was willing to renounce or give up its wider or larger ambitions in order to reach an accommodation. So they really weren't looking to accommodate each other. They're just playing a game until they can do their attacking. In part, to counter the Russian threat, Japan signed a formal alliance in 1902 with Russia's foremost global imperial rival. Who could that be? Let me turn the page and find out. Wow. Who could that be? Britain. Britain, right? Uh, under the terms of the Anglo-Japanese Treaty, both countries pledged to aid each other if it became involved in a war with more than one adversary. Let me see, uh, this looks a little tricky. Okay, yeah. This gave the Japanese a freer hand to confront Russia and Korea, right? That's where they wanted anyway. Negotiations with Russia broke off February 6, 1904, and war was declared four days later. Uh-oh, the second war. But Japan had doubled their military and won a prior war, so they felt confident. Hmm, I don't know. Active hostilities began a day, which means actual fighting before the formal declaration of war uh, with a surprise Japanese night attack on the naval base at Port Arthur in which two Russian battleships and a cruiser were struck by torpedoes. So that brings me to the bottom for Li Xuan of 244, which means I have to ask some questions. board, pencil, before my students steal it, oh sorry, pencil, right, okay, that will put me on question 10.
Question 10. How did Japan perceive Korea at this time? Be careful in the writing, it's, there's like two similar definitions. So make sure you got the correct one. Okay, the key, the key word to look for is perceive. I try to make it easy on you folks by using a word from where the actual answer is like a verb and then you can find it, okay? I don't try to be tricky, like my students would try to be tricky with me and take the test with a cell phone. How dare you? Hurts my feelings. Okay, 11. Make sure I write this correctly. Where was Russia's interest? Was it in Alaska? Now, my students are gonna laugh. Teacher, you're trying to trick us. Did you know that United States had to buy Alaska from Russia? Did you know that? But maybe I'm not lying here. Maybe I'm not tricking you. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, on this short page, I only have two questions. I wanted to write more. I must be getting weak must make you guys learn hard and suffer. So uh, write these two down and I'll make my markings here to mark off for Li Xuan the way I end Wani maybe. Uh, 244 is done and the appropriate questions are done. So I guess it's eraser time since it was only two. Oh, eraser, Yogi saw. 10, how did Japan perceive Korea at this time? Hmm, Japan thought Korea had the best K-pop stars. That's what Japan thought about Korea in 1905. Uh, 11, where was Russia's interest? I, if I'm a gambling man, I will say Alaska. Okay. Now we're back to the delicious reading. Um, this is in which Russian battleships are stuck by two torpedoes. And then uh, Nice uh, Japanese drawing here of the Battle of the Russo-Japanese War at Chinmulpo. Does anybody know where Chinmulpo is? Is it near uh, Poang? Okay, so continuing. Uh, the Sismoni Institute, that's a credit to the picture. Okay. Now we're on to the next page. If one, you can guess what it is. Russia was a major world power with vastly superior potential resources than newly industrializing little Japan. So we know newly industrializing. China wanted to catch up to them. And although Japanese scored some early victories on the battlefield, none were decisive. So that means small victories, nothing large enough to really worry the Russian side. The cost of war to Japan was staggering. Staggering means so very high. It may be the cost of lives and money. You can't even understand the value. So, and again, here we're going with the two points I just made. Both in the number of lives lost, 81,000, 455 Japanese dead soldiers. And in the skyrocketing, which means ever increasing, fast like a skyrocket, debt necessary to fund it. So yes, as you're going to war and 
getting a lot of soldiers and buying ships and ammunition costs a lot of money. So the debt just rises. Russia, on the other hand, was large enough to suffer heavy losses and continue fighting. I, I personally think that this is a Russian cultural technique. And I will explain why as I give you an example that hopefully will open your eyes. I was shocked when I read it. So again, what it's saying here, um, Russia was large enough that they were able to suffer heavy losses, which means lose a lot of soldiers, a lot, and uh, continue fighting. So I've read accounts of when uh, Nazi Germany invaded Russia. And uh, let's say at the beginning of the war, Nazi Germany had the most modern and most powerful machine guns, rifles, ammunition, you name it. They had it. So when the Russians came to fight them with old style rifles and what have you, the Nazis were laughing, but the Russian culture, the Russian thinking, is they just kept on sending men, even some soldiers without even weapons. Why? <laughs> because eventually the Nazis ran out of bullets. And they didn't have anything to defend themselves with. So as they had uh, many more soldiers than the Nazis, then eventually after thousands of Russians were killed, the back part of the charge, they kept on coming. So even with outdated old weapons, they were able to easily kill the Nazis. So it seems to be a recurring theme in the fighting of Russian soldiers. The Japanese high command therefore grew anxious to negotiate an end to the war quickly as they realized they were losing. And an opportunity to seek peace on favorable terms came after a smashing, which means very good, Japanese naval victory at Tsushima on May 27, 1905. The Russian Baltic fleet, consisting of 11 battleships, had sailed halfway around the world to reinforce the Russian forces in the Pacific. But it was intercepted toward the end of its long voyage near Tsushima, an island lying between Korea and Japan, by a fleet of five Japanese battleships. The Japanese performed the classic naval maneuver known as crossing the T, and that would be at the top, in which all of their big guns were able to fire broadsides on the oncoming Russian ships, while the Russians could only bring their forward guns to bear. It's pretty, pretty scary stuff when you think about it. You can't, you can't hit anything. Uh, wow, it's just scary thinking about it. Um, in just 45 minutes of action, the Russian fleet was annihilated. You know, wow. Uh, while the Japanese suffered only minimal or small losses, Japan was now in a position to approach the President of the United States. Theodore Roosevelt for the request to mediate or decide more or less. And the war was ended by the Treaty of Portsmouth, New Hampshire in September, 1905. As a result of the war, Russia ceded or gave its concessions in southern Manchuria to China, so they gave Japan the power of Manchuria and renounced or gave up their interests in Korea. But the Russian bargaining position was still strong enough that Russia could not be compelled or forced to pay war reparations to Japan. 
and what war reparations are. For example, the United States defeated Japan in World War II. And even though they were the winners or the victors, uh, they decided to give a lot of money to repair what had become destroyed in Japan. And that was a big help in helping Japan turn around its economy. Uh, some countries do not get war reparations and it takes them a long time to come back to where they once were. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then it says, although Japan uh, had won the war, therefore many Japanese people felt. And that brings me to the bottom of 245. Pay attention, Yishuan. Okay. So it's time for more questions. Whiteboard, pencil. Uh, this will bring me to question 12. Make sure I write this correctly. How many soldiers did Japan lose in their last war with Russia? This is a Temujin question. Why? Because Temujin loves questions where he can just put a number, right? He doesn't want to write in English, so he just puts a number. So that's what I'm asking you for here. Just give me a number. And uh, on this page of 245, I'm only going to give you two questions. I only have one more. So. You can send the donations to my email, okay? Large bills only. Oops, let me get the spelling correct. Uh, the last one on this page, what was the Treaty of Port's mouth? It has nothing to do with the mouth, it has nothing to do with port wine, but what was the Treaty of Port's mouth? Okay, so let me give you a few on those and let me make my markings on my end. Again, that was 245 if you're in the book. And let me mark off the appropriate uh, questions. So believe it or not, this will lead us into our last page for this week, 246, unless Titan wants me to do 10 more pages, which I can go make copies and do it really quick if you let me do it. Do you want that Titan, 10 more pages? <laughs> Maybe I'll be kind. Okay. All right. Do you have those two written down? Can am I able to go for my eraser before you know, my students like Paul steals the eraser? Okay. I would say Inky, but I think she's angry today. Okay. Eraser. Twelve. How many soldiers did Japan lose in their last war? Just give me the number. My only hint is it's more than 10. They don't give me some small number. Okay, so 12 will be fun. 13, what was the treaty of Portsmouth? I cannot think of a good hint to give you. So I'll just leave it as it is. Okay, that's how I'm done. So, Okay, this should be, once I match this up, 
we shall be on the last part. At least I think so. Right. All right. So. All right, Japanese domination. Let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. So the Meiji oligarch. Okay. Oligarch meaning the person in complete power. Ito Hirobumi, architect of the Meiji Constitution, copied after the US Constitution. And Japan's first prime minister was brought in to serve as Japan's first resident. General uh, in Korea, but Emperor Kojong, which I've been in Korea and I drove his car that he had. He had a Mercedes and I drove it all the way to Mokdong. Uh, but Emperor Kojong had agreed to the Japanese protectorate only under duress, which means stress or force, if at all. And in 1906, 1907, he publicly appealed. This is uh, for world support against Japan, in particular with a mission to a peace conference at The Hague in the Netherlands. Okay. Japanese domination was now irreversible, which means you could not change it. However, and in 1907, Emperor Pochong abdicated in favor of his son, which means he said he gave up the kingdom and gave his son the position. By now, all laws, important decisions, and appointments of high officials required the Japanese resident general's approval. So even though King Kojong or her son was in power, the person who actually had the power was the Japanese general living there, the palace. Uh, the Korean army was disbanded, so no more Korean army was gotten rid of. And many former Korean soldiers joined the anti-Japanese guerrillas in the mountainside. And in 1907, I'm, so, I'm sorry, um, there was 2,000, this might be a question for you, 819 armed clashes, which means fights where people died and were killed, arms, guns with Korean guerrillas. And in 1907, in a coordinated attack on the headquarters of Japanese residency general, they wanted to kill that guy, one particularly large guerrilla force penetrated to within eight miles of Seoul. Wow. The modern Japanese army was too powerful though for disorganized guerrillas to overcome. However, and the overall Japanese presence in Korea was meanwhile expanding rapidly, multiplying tenfold between 1900 and 1910. In the southern port city of Busan, half the population became Japanese. Can you imagine that today? Half the population of Busan being Japanese. And much of the town was Japanese built. In the years after the establishment of the protectorate, again, Korea being a protectorate of Japan, the Japanese residency general financed its program for the creation of modern banking facilities and roads in Korea through Japanese loans to the Korean government. This put the Koreans heavily in debt to Japan. Partly on the pretext of these unpaid debts and the assassination of Ito Hirobumi by a Korean nationalist in 1909, Japan openly annexed Korea as a formal colony in 1910. So before Protector is kind of saying, no, 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 Korea can govern itself. We're just here to protect. 
in certain ways. But now they said, hey, now Korea officially is a colony. And that ends our reading for today. But you know, I'm going to have some questions maybe. Okay. So whiteboard time. Pencil. Okay, I'm trying to think, should I be kind and give you only one question or two since we're at the end? We'll see. If Titan gets me angry, what I'm going to do, you know, I get so tough. And make sure I write this correctly. In 1905, Korea was reduced to what? So prior, Korea had been its own independent country, but now in 1905, it was reduced to what? So again, I'm trying to think, how kind should I be? So, hmm, can I ask one more? Yes, I, I think Temujin wants me to, that's why. So, but I'll, I'll put it on myself. I'll do a long question and you give me, this will be a Temujin answer. This will be a short answer, okay? So you see, we all know why this is a Temujin question. It's a number question. So here we go. Oh, my fingers just fell off writing this long question. The Korean people did not like this. I, this is connected 15 to 14. In 1905, Korea was addressed to what? So once you get the answer there and you find out, now you can say Korean people did not like this situation and skirmished with the Japanese army. How many times did they skirmish? Again, that is. Uh, Number answer. Okay. So let me make my markings for 7 20 2020. Let me mark off my questions. So we've completed all we need to complete. So uh, I'll go over these again and I'll erase them and then you're, you're free to go and enjoy yourself. Let me get the eraser. 14, in 1905, Korea was reduced to what? Again, prior, they were a full independent country. That's out. The Korean people did not like this situation, referring to 14, and skirmish with the Japanese army. How many times? Again, I'm going to tell you it's more than 10 times. All right? So that is done. And uh, you guys are done for the day. And I shall... Unless you want to see my face one more time, you probably don't need to. Uh, I shall see you next week. Okay, so everybody take care, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.